Welcome to the Bill Cartwright Show. We have a, a coach extraordinaire, Rob Dinerman, uh, the executive director of the John Maxwell Group. Uh, we're very pleased to have him here. Rob, welcome to the show. It is great to be here, Bill. Thank you for uh, bringing me aboard. You know, a, a big part of what we do uh, in, in playing and coaching is having somebody, uh, a coach, uh, a mentor, a friend, somebody who can get us to that next level. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's just extraordinarily important. And it, and it kind of happens naturally. It could be a father. It could be uh, a neighborhood friend. It could be your first, uh, your, your first coach, your first teacher. Um, before we do that, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, where, where did you grow up? I grew up in a, in a town called Colonia, New Jersey. Uh, I've stayed in New Jersey most of my life. Uh, I was the youngest of three boys. I was raised by a single mom in the 60s, which it was not cool being a single mom in the 60s. So I have a very interesting passage. My, my father wasn't around. And uh, I had coaches and mentors. They just happened to be two brothers, two years older than I, I was. Not a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> They're great. They were great guys, but um, you don't want to be raised by your older brothers. Went to business school at, at, at Wharton. I was blessed to be able to get in and started my career on Wall Street. Worked for some very uh, interesting people. Uh, John Merriweather, Lou Ramiri. Uh, worked with Michael Bloomberg, who was running the IT desk. He later on become, became mayor and obviously one of the wealthiest people in the country. But I was a newbie. I was, we'll, we'll just say I was a rookie. Uh, but that was not my profession. Uh, I knew probably from year one that what Wall Street had to offer in the environment that it has was not an environment that was really survivable for me. I didn't think of it that way. But what I was good is at translating information between people and I got involved in technology sales, which was the bulk of my career for about 25 years. In 1993, I met a gentleman named John Maxwell he has since then sold 34 million books on the topic of leadership and communication. He's my friend, he's my mentor. And when I got out of technology about seven years ago, I decided that what I was applying his tools and techniques to make sales teams work in the technology world at some pretty large companies like Oracle and Sun and Gartner, I wanted to apply that to individuals and teams both in the small business world and in the large business world. And so that's what I do. I coach individuals and teams to help them reach their goals, to help them self-actualize. Sometimes that's monetary, but other times it has to do with things like faith and family and what they're doing on the social side of their life as well. Now, let's take first things first. Let's talk about the individual. So when you meet with an individual, from, from a team, what are your first thoughts? I want to know what, there's a gap, there's this performance gap, performance between what they are thinking about and what they do. So they're coming to me or someone like me for a reason. The question is, why do they think they're coming to me? And so I will try as best as possible to find out their why, W-H-Y. Simon Sinek wrote a, a great book called First Ask Why. And it's about what essentially is the reason you're doing anything. And so that's the first thing I want to do is find out why. I may not be the right person, the right coach for that person. In football parlance, you don't go to a quarterback coach if you're, you know, on the line. Right, there's a specific person. In basketball, there are people that are much more gifted at teaching free throws than, than dribbling and outside shooting. And so I may not be the right person. I wanna know what their why is and whether we can uh, work together. And that's sort of a sense that we'll both get. So, so since there are so many different types of people and uh, we really deal with it, I work for the University of San Francisco because you're dealing with men, women, 
uh, maybe different guys, maybe they're, uh, believe it or not, maybe they're too tall or too short, or maybe they're overweight or, or they're gay or lesbian. And uh, just the diversity of the, of the people that you're dealing with, uh, how do you know if you're suited or not suited because they're, because just because of the diversity? You know, that is actually a brilliant question. Um, <clears throat> The basis of coaching, the way we teach coaching, again, in a Socratic method, is about raising people's level of awareness. Uh, Carl Jung said, unless you make the unconscious conscious, it will rule your life, meaning the unconscious will your, rule your life and you will call it fate. So your question is, we, we're an the great thing about the United States is we are incredibly diverse. I'm five foot three. Right. And so there are 20, probably 22 inches, if my math is right, <clears throat> between you and me. I'm white, you're black. But we all have some fundamental things we're trying to solve. Why are we here? And you can ask questions of anybody from any background to help them solve that problem or to help them get to another level, a promotion. So diversity is important, and I don't want to minimize that there might be a relatability issue. But anyone can really coach anyone if they have the right questioning technique. The basis of what we do uh, came from a book, the, the Inner Game of Tennis. And the gentleman that wrote that, and, and his name slips me, was a tennis coach, but he decided to change the way he was going to teach tennis. This was in 1974. He took some of his work from a gentleman called Maxwell Malt, who wrote a book called Cybernetics uh, about self-image. But he had this theory that he could do more with a tennis player instead of telling him how to serve and how to do baseline game and how to throw the ball up by asking them questions. In fact, he got so good at this that he took the soccer team of where he was coaching at the time. He said, you're going to be tennis coaches, brought them to a tennis team, soccer players, bringing them to a, I think it was a D2 college tennis team and said to the tennis team, here are your new coaches. They are going to teach you how to play tennis. And his instructions were simple for these soccer players. Just ask them questions. So what would happen? There would be a volley going on and a tennis player would hit the ball perfectly. And the soccer coach, who's being portrayed as a tennis coach said, what did you do differently this time when you hit than the last time when you hit it outside the court? And the tennis player would go, well, my racket was a little higher. Great, keep on going. And then he would start isolating behavior by asking the tennis player uh, questions. That entire team improved significantly working with people that knew nothing about tennis. So I don't necessarily have to know your background. Uh, it's always helpful, but sometimes it can get in the way. I just need to be able to ask you pertinent questions. Do you think people get a little bounded? And this is why I ask, because everybody says you can't want them all. And I'm a big advocate is that you can't win them all because I've been on teams. We're 30 and oh. So why do you think people have such a mindset that you can win them all? The, the question is, <clears throat> what information as an individual do you gain from the win? And what information do you gain from the loss? So there's this expression, you fail your way to success. <clears throat> It's not the experience of winning or losing that's important. It is that this is one of John's best teachings. I'd love to take credit for it, but it's a John Maxwell teaching. It is the evaluation of the experience. So, so Bill, let's just take uh, going 70, what, what was it 72 wins or 70 wins? I forget the number. At what important time during that season, did you stop learning from winning? Well, you don't. You don't stop learning. Because there's always a process. And on the games that you lost, 
were there lessons to be learned, even though there were very few of them? Well, I, I, I think the big thing was that there was something special that happened in the course of that game that allowed us not to win the game. It's not that we did not play well, but something special happened and a special circumstance that didn't allow us to, to have the victory. But but I've never considered a law a because we didn't score a many points, a loss. It was just as something else happened. Because we, we could play extraordinarily well and not win. But to me, that's not a loss. That's because something else happened. That, that is a great, a great comment in terms of something else. When that something else happened, uh, okay, so you have coaches on the sidelines, you go in, you review the game. Um, does that question come up? Do you ask yourselves as a team or does the coach point out to you, hey, this was great, but this extra thing happened or this thing happened different? Is it pointed out to you? Well, you see it all the time in sports where a team could play extraordinarily well and then the last play of the game, you turn the ball over or miss a free throw. And then at the buzzer, the team hits a three, a running three, falling down, and something happens that you know may never happen again. So if that is really possible. So in a coaching session, <clears throat> I'll call it executive coaching mindset session, this is exactly what happens. And I'll take an average example of an average, uh, I'll just say a, a woman that I, I've seen this scores of times in my business, but someone comes to me and, and says, I want to get a, a raise. I want to get a promotion. I have very, very high end clients. I have teams that I coach, but I want to talk about something that everybody could relate to. And, and we go into the process of why do you want to get a raise? Why do you want to get a promotion? Because that's fundamental because they may not want to get a raise. They may not want to get a promotion. Maybe they want recognition. But that notwithstanding, what we'll do is we will review the game. And the game may consist of a meeting where they were around a table and they were asked something and they were the subject matter expert and they believed what they thought the company should do, but they were afraid to express it in front of that big group. And a week later, they go in and the, their manager says, you know, we really want to get more from you. So we'll do a review of these plays and I will ask them that question. What I need to do instead of instead of the coach telling them, hey, this is the event that turned the game, I will ask questions and I'll say, Susan, what do you think happened in that meeting that would have your manager say they want more from you? And we'll review it. And I'll keep on asking questions. And fundamentally, they will come up with that exceptional event. Fundamentally, if we ask the question right, they'll say, you know, I was asked my opinion on something, but I chose not to do it because I really just didn't want to offend anybody there. And that is a huge breakthrough. That is the unconscious being coming conscious. And then we'll get into what happened. What was it about that fear, right? You will always surrender to either the stronger emotion of fear or faith. We'll get into what that fear was and then make sure that we come across a process, a very simple iterative process that matches their why do they wanna get the promotion so that this doesn't happen again. So we really break it down play, play by play. But what's important is for me, once you explain the situation, I could have told her what the problem was. That is what most people think coaching is. It's really more mentoring. But the only way she would learn is for her to think of it herself, understand why she did it, and then where I could come in is through processes that she could use to get better. And that's a real, real simple case of, of, uh, of coaching and the value and why it really doesn't matter, getting back to your original question, it doesn't matter where someone comes from, though sometimes if you know somebody's background or behavior or culture, it, it can be handled. 
Hey, can you talk to you about team sports? I was very fortunate to have an opportunity to go over to Japan mm -hmm. and uh, take over a team, and we were five and 19. Mm -hmm. And um, I had about a week to, <laughs> to chase our culture. And fortunately, we were really able to do that uh, by just giving them um, an identity. Can you talk about team sports or team building uh, to change a culture? Oh, absolutely. The probably from a book work perspective, the most valuable tool I have is something called the 17 uh, Irrefutable Laws of Teamwork. And it addresses that because everything does have culture in DNA. And you know what? DNA culture beats strategy 100% of the time. So uh, just an experience that I had, and I'll translate that into some of the work I do. My freshman year in college, I was a walk-on on the University of Pennsylvania fencing team. I didn't know anything about the team. Uh, I had gained too much weight to be the coxswain on the on, on crew, which I was. <laughs> I went from 115 to 145 in a year. They don't want me in the boat. I walk onto this team and the coach who I didn't know, right? Uh, Dave Mechanic. Turns out he was a three-time Olympian and also coached the Olympic team. So I didn't even know the University of Pennsylvania had a world-class fencing team. I walked in because I wanted something to do. He says, on guard. And I, I did take some martial arts. So I knew what the standard on guard position is, which was similar to fencing. Long story short, I didn't know this team had a DNA, a culture of success. They were expected to compete and win the Ivy League title every year. They were expected to do one, two, or three in the NC2As. And so that was the culture I walked into. And so I had to train to that culture. And by the time I graduated, we had won three Ivy League championships, one uh, team championship, and then we placed second in what's known as the individual championship. So how does something like that relate to working in the executive world or the team sports? I'm gonna make a statement and tell me whether you think this is true in terms of team sports, your team sports, not corporate team sports. One is too small a number to achieve greatness. No. One person can change your entire organization. One person can change the organization, but do they need a supporting cast? They absolutely need a supporting cast. Yeah, even if you take individual performance on golf, take any golf pro that's in the top, probably 50, how many, what is their supporting cast like? They probably have a mindset coach, they have a swing coach, they may have a short game coach. Uh, in basketball, you have your starting five, your sixth man, and then you have six other players that occasionally have to come in, particularly when somebody significantly gets injured. So we call that the law of significance when it comes to corporate training and corporate team training, that any individual in their role cannot achieve the corporate goal by themselves. The CEO can't, the CXO can't, and in, in the technology world, the systems analyst who's writing code just cannot achieve it uh, on their own. Uh, next thing in terms of teamwork, because this is what we teach in the corporate world and it, it matches. So here, here's the statement. The goal is more important than the role, R-O-L-E. Well, yeah, you need a goal, you need a vision. Right, so we call that the law of the big picture when we teach it. In other words, if in the corporate world, your goal is to increase uh, earnings before interest and taxes, commonly known as EBITDA, that's great. But if my role as a salesperson is to, and I think I should spend all the money in the world and not bring in revenue, well, that's really inconsistent with the goal. And even though my role as a salesperson to get out there, I have to be cognizant of what the overarching goal is of the organization. If I have a product line that I think is great, but 
it really doesn't match the goal of the organization. My role may be the chief innovation officer, but what I innovate has to be in tune with what, what, what the organization uh, has. If uh, I am the best point guard in the world, and uh, there are a couple of people out there that, that, that we know, and I shoot 30 to 40 points per game, um, that's great, except that's not necessarily going to achieve the goal of getting enough players involved so that you could win the game, win your conference, get in the top eight and get in the championships. Uh, I'll, I'll go with the last one because it's just so consistent with sports play. Um, all players have a place where they add the most value. And that's true. Yeah. I think, you, but, but you know what's interesting is that uh, my vision for you, let's say like when I, when I was a, first came in the league, I was a scorer. And then later on, as I went to the Bulls, I was a defender. So the acceptance of that role, a lot of guys can't handle. Now, luckily, it was later on in my career, so I could accept it. But you could be a great scorer, and your role, what's best for that team, it may be a defender. How, how, do, you, how do you get people to accept that kind of a role? Let me give you a, a real life example. This happens all the time at the higher level. It really does. Um, one of my clients, uh, she was a, a C minus one chairman of the board, minus one or two at a large uh, division of, of, of a bank. And one thing about my profession is it is fully confidential. Uh, I generally uh, get all of my business through referrals or sometimes I do broadcasts like this. So I, I try not to use uh, initials particularly if I'm dealing with some high-end clients. This was her question to me. Uh, she got introduced to me from somebody from, from uh, Wharton Alumni Association. Rob, there's a seed of discontent. I'm paraphrasing, but I'm discontent in my current role. I'm lead, I mean, she's leading a team of thousands, obviously has a, has a core of about a dozen, dozen direct reports. And I think what I wanna do is retire and go start and work for one of the 501c3s. She was very generous, a woman. And I think that's what I want to do, but I'm not sure. Do you think you can help me with this? Bill, you were a scorer. Um, I think that as much as I still think you have that in you, in our team, what we really want you to do is play a more defensive role, keep people out of the middle fundamental change, fundamental view, and, and some fundamentally different skills. So the real question is, is this something you would want to do? Is this something she would want to do? What is the why for, for doing that? What is the why for accepting the role? I, I'd, like to try, I'd like to have this discussion. I want to translate it back into the sports world, but just let me do a short shift on, on what we went through with her. She was looking to do something more than self-actualize. You know, Maslow has this hierarchy of needs. Most people think it stops at self-actualization, which is meaning you've gotten more out of you than you can possibly think. You've maximized who you are. Most people don't know that Maslow did his later years work on the concept of transcendence, one level above self-actualization. And transcendence is about how many people you help achieve their goal. How many coaches help a player, maybe they never get to the championships, but they become the best player possible and they become a great person. Or how many coaches do three feats. So we went through an iterative process. What does it mean to go to the 501c3? And what does that mean to her? She, she had a great family life great husband, great kids. I mean, it was really just a wonderful person to work with. But then we boiled down to her team. She had 12 managers and as you go down, they affected thousands of people in this organization. When we finally got down to it, when we finally talked about what her reason why, and I come up with a base question. And the base question we came up with was, she wanted to impact people. 
and how many more people could she impact staying at the organization in a little bit different role or basically retiring and working on the 501c3? As we worked through it, as we asked every question, can you impact more people by working in this, org this organization, training these 12 people to be the best they can be and the impact they have? knowing that this organization did a lot of charitable work, did a lot of different things. Or when you go to any one of these 50C3s as a board member, will you truly have as much of an impact? And so as we went through that question, it was about eight, nine months of work, she decided to stay. And she decided to stay because she felt that in her new role as a coach, as I taught her, in a mentor, which she was always pretty good, she would ultimately be able to uh, impact tens of thousands of people through all the resources those people had and the company had. So in the team world, when you're asked to take a reduced role, um, you said, can we help? How do you help someone do that? You have to go to the base motivation of somebody who wants to stay in the game. And maybe, they want to stay in the game to mentor. I, you know, I, I listened to both of your earlier podcasts and it is rare that people will almost always lead with their compliments about an individual like you, you Bill, and say, what a great mentor, what a great teamwork. You, you were always lauded as a great player, but um, you know, in talking with, 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 with uh, Mike or when you were talking with Mike, uh, and, and Mr. Armstrong, I believe. Uh, BJ, yeah. About what? It, it was about what a great person you were in every role you had. So if somebody is going to take a different role, the question is, how do you get to understand, help them understand that this is their best, highest value now, or maybe they need to leave the business? And there's some people that would need to leave the business. Uh, Tom, Tom Brady, you know, he wanted to be number one. He has his way of thinking of the world. He has something else. He wants, I'll just assume he wants to win a championship without Belichick or something like that. But every great player, if they're healthy, ultimately is, in sports is, is key uh, to think about this. You will eventually be asked to play a lesser role. What value do you find in terms of when I'm at the end of my life, did I maximize my time in this industry with these positions to help affecting other people? Yeah, I just, I just think that that's really uh, just mindset why, just because of what you said, we want you to do less. And I think that it's the idea that by doing less, you're actually doing more because we're working with this team. That's going to be your best value. That's how we're going to win. Uh, we're going to win games. But it is a really tough mindset. And also, uh, another really tough mindset for, for a team is what do you do if your best performer, your best player, uh, and there's a lot of examples, misbehaves? So what do you do about that? Because you need this guy desperately, and his character is just is just not very good. Uh, character is really everything when it comes to the DNA of an organization. So when when you talk about, there are a lot of great examples. I would guess um, in the second run with the Bulls, probably the the. Dennis Rodman character come, comes to mind. And so, you know, how do you work with someone like that, right? You could take, let's put it this way, in the corporate world, because of the uh, compliance issues and the legal issues, there, there's a real zero tolerance policy. Uh, uh, there used to not be, but, not, but now that now there is. In the sports world, when you have somebody that that's good, when in, in his case, 
Phil and the team, and, and if you look at the leadership, Phil, and in reading the books, I, I know you referred to the last dance. I have to say that I didn't watch it because I knew that it would be a production that was there for my entertainment, not to truly reflect exactly what happened. Um, but the question is, in a business where it's short term, because sports is short term, I need to win, I need to win this year, there's a high tolerance for that because of the short term outlook. There is high tolerance for misbehavior. And unless you have a DNA that says it is the culture and what the organization that represents that matters most, there's nothing you can do as a coach or even as a manager. If you think about the front office says, I don't really care, I want the guy to pitch, I want the guy to kick, I want the guy to throw, I want the guy to play. Um, then there's nothing you can do as a coach. That would be a client. If I knew the DNA, the organization, I'm trying to fix behavior. Uh, not every client's for me and I wouldn't take it because I'd have zero chance of success. I'd take a preliminary interview if the player wanted to be better, if they wanted to have a change in behavior. I'm not a therapist, but what you can do is create a bigger picture, let them know the impact of what they're doing and give them small strategies, tactical strategies, not therapeutic strategies to help them achieve a goal that they would want. And if their goal is, I want to be a better player or better person, but I just get into these things, there are some non-therapeutic ways to handle that. But by and large, in the sports world, where it's season by season, pretty tough to manage around a player that is that good that you want to kick off or bench or whatever, because you'll deal with the, the issues or you'll let the press deal with the issues. Yeah, I don't want to call anybody by name, but uh, that happens really in every sport, basketball, baseball, football. Uh, and it's interesting that in a professional level, they end up going to another team and somehow some coach thinks that I can coach him, <laughs> which is always humorous to me. In, in college, uh, if you misbehave, you're, you're probably not going to be at that school very long, but it's really interesting. So what should you think... Uh, you're an aging executive, somebody like a Steve Cohen. What do you do? What's your mindset should be? <laughs> um, because let's say, because it, it's really scary, I think, to switch jobs. I've, I've uh, you know, in sports, it happens all the time where you go to another team. But then after that uh, career is over, I experienced a year of anxiety because it was uh, this kind of a norm that you have playing sports, it's physical, it's mental. Uh, and it took a year for me to shake it off. Um, what do you what do you tell guys who or gals who after their careers is winding down, what's that next step should be? What should your mindset be? Really, really great question. You know, a lot of the better organizations, and I think some in sports uh, as well, have transition services for executives where you're retiring in two years and, and they put you through a whole regimen. Here is the key, a key to answering any transition question, and it's the long view. It's keeping the end in, the end in mind. When I work with people, a fundamental question I ask is, when you're 85 or 90 or whatever the number is, whatever your gene pool says that you're, you're gonna to live to, and you're having some of your conversations with family and close friends that are around, what do you want that conversation to be? What do you think it's going to sound like? Uh, is it gonna sound like, hey, boy, you went took that corporation and you increased their revenues by 50% uh, every year for 20 years. Or is that conversation that you really helped a lot of people with the resources of the organization? You use that to help society in general and the community you belong to. You use the resources that you were given to help disadvantaged people or whatever your calling is. So if we can construct, and it's pretty easy to do it, uh, I, I give people a timeline. 
And this is what you can do it right here. I have them draw a line, a simple line. And I have them put 50 in the middle. I have them put 100 at the end and I have put zero uh, at the beginning. And those are ages. And I said, put a dot where you are. And Bill, you and I are about the same age. And then my gene pool says, every says that I'm at least gonna live until I'm 89. So we do some simple math and we say, I have at least a quarter century left to live. And when you put that in perspective, when somebody looks at that and they're about to retire or, they, or they're in a transition and they start looking at the amount of time, the next question I'll ask is, hey, Bill, what did you achieve between the ages? You, we agree that you have 25 more years to live or 20 more years. What did you achieve between the ages of 20 and 40? So you point back to somebody, the immense amount of personal and professional growth they achieved in a time period. And then I reflect, so do you have any less time based upon everything we know between 20 and 40 and what you have? How much do you think we can accomplish now that you don't have the burdens of nine to five or having to work out and have this unbearable pressure that very few people, people, you know, people look at professional athletes and I think rock stars and movie stars and say, awesome. I haven't worked with A-listers, but there's, I have worked with A-listers in the executive world. There's a tremendous burden and cost to success if you don't have the, the right outlook. And even if you do, because Bill, if, if you're successful, it means that you have a supporting cast of family, team, people that have revenue that are relying on you, people don't get that. So if you're headed out the door and you know you're headed out the door and you know intellectually there's a certain amount of time, then we start breaking it down into what do we want to achieve in buckets? What do you want to achieve in terms of your family over the next 20 years? In terms of society, you know, maybe you've had to work 60 hours a week or you've had to focus everything on yourself and your body. And people don't understand that good professional athletes focus a tremendous amount of time on their body and their mind. What are we going to do from a societal perspective? What are we going to do in terms of your friendships? What are we going to do in terms of social organizations that you belong to? And then we start carving out and then we say, okay, and let's look at the economic part of that life, the financial part of that life. Are there things that you want to do to expand that? My good friend, John Maxwell could have retired. He built this team. We have 40,000 people worldwide that teach leadership, communication, public speaking. And he started building that when he was 62. Wow. Okay, it is the largest professional development organization in the world. And a gentleman named Paul Martinelli, I need to give Paul kudos, came to John with an idea. He said, I'll do all the work. I will provide all the funding. John, you have the intellectual property and you're the best public speaker in the world. And you have the best philosophy of success. And they put together this thing called the John Maxwell team at the latter ages of their life. So we start working with people and understand that Let's assign a value to the rest of your life. Because what happens is, you know, take a, take, a, I guess football, I mean, people get injured really quickly in football. And so you take a rock star who's out of college and maybe they get a $10 million contract, but they're out in two years because they get a permanent injury. You know, they built a whole expectation on the rest of their life surrounding that. Um, Success begins with understanding that what you do is not who you are. Try and create who you are and whatever you do is just gonna be a reflection of that. And then, we, then people have to understand that there's a tremendous amount of abundance out there. And we work, when I work with people on this, I work in terms of abundance versus scarcity. Oh, I can't, the last 20 years, I can't possibly do what I did with the first 40 years. And we have to understand and get through this whole abundance conversation. What, what, what makes you, you think that? 
Um, I could give you example after example after example of people that became incredible successes in the latter part of their lives. You know, Andrew Carnegie, who was the wealthiest man in the world at the time, really did become exceptionally wealthy until in his 50s. Uh, most people that achieve great wealth don't, don't do that as success. So people have to understand that there is tomorrow, that tomorrow is based on who I truly want to be, do and have, when I really can't do anything about it. And I can achieve all of that because we live in an abundant world and I just help them tap into their natural abundance. So do you think this really, really hard? Um, and, and the reason I see it's really hard um, because I, I, I know a guy that guys and gals who've been in the Olympics. Um, and if you're a professional athlete, uh, for, for a lot of guys, the average life of an NBA player is less than three years. Football, same thing. Yeah. Uh, so you kind of peak out. And it's, it's like being an astronaut. So what do you do after you've gone to the moon? You've gone to the moon. So now, what in the world am I going to do? Hey, I went to the moon. Top that. So what do you do after that? Uh, can I harken back to this thing called Maslow's hierarchy of needs and this thing called self-actualization? I love the way you phrased it, Bill, because it, it's the I. I went to the moon. Yeah, I had a team of a thousand people or two thousand people that helped, but I went to the moon. As part of something I do on the side, I'm involved in, in, in uh, a congregational care ministry, and I have been at the deathbed of people. And the conversation rarely comes up with I. People will understand that it's who they've impacted. And if you take people that go from peak performance to peak performance, and this was that woman's problem that she was trying to solve while she was almost at the peak of career, looking at changing the roles and thinking, I can impact more folks. When you can engage someone in a discussion that because they've been given a platform, uh, and maybe a good example of this might be Tim Tebow, a uh, great college player. Every, <laughs> look, everybody but him didn't think he was gonna make it in, in in, um, in, the, in, a, in the NFL, for whatever reason, it didn't work out. But that's at the point, he was able to establish a platform, just like you were able to establish a platform. Now, Rob Neinerman is in a very different world, but I have a platform that I've been able to establish with the John Maxwell team, with the Wharton Alumni Association, and it's a small platform where I can impact a lot of people. So when we talk about, let's take the high school athlete, right? Who's, you know, you're, not, you're the number one guy on your team. And then all of a sudden you're the number one guy on a team that has a lot of number one guys. And you, you just found out that you're the least talented team, least talented person. But you have a platform and, and people need to understand that Let's say you're a D1 recruit and you're number 12 and then you graduate, you're not going to pl go play. You're not going to be able to go play. Understand that in the rest of the world, the fact that you were recruited as a D1 player on a top 50 team, name it, put you in rarefied air. You have a tremendous platform. So what we try and do, regardless of where this person is from, is to let them understand the gift they've been given. But they have, that has to come out through the unconscious. It is incredibly hard work for somebody who thought they're going to be making 20 to 40 million a year for the next 10 to 20 years. And now maybe they got a, maybe they just made the one year minimum of 610,000 bucks and that's it. And getting them to understand that they have a platform and see the value, that's a huge win for someone like me, but it takes hard work, Bill. It takes humility but it's there and most people can cross that barrier. And I just, I just, it's just really um, funny to me that because people do reflect on what we, what happened in high school, almost like that's, that's, that's their peak or what happened in college. And maybe if you're a female, um, 
you the, the height is when you had your kids and that's that was the best time of your life and it's it's being able to move from there and being able to recognize that no we, we you can still accomplish whatever you want to accomplish and I, I think that's really difficult i know it's really difficult for a lot of athletes um and just generally that um they have the idea, this is the peak, this is it. Uh, this is when I was at my best. Um, I don't view it that way, but, uh, but but I think a lot of people do. They do, and that's why it's so important to, look, to have people look at the long view and how much time they have to actually go to another peak performance and peak performance. And it's interesting you, you bring up, up uh, women, uh, they make up more than half of my practice. Uh, I think because women are very amenable. Guys, guys have a certain amount of hubris and hubris doesn't get you anywhere. Women are very amenable to take, taking coaching, but they do have a much more complicated journey because they do bear children and there's just nothing the world is gonna be able to do about that. And each and every one that I speak to go through a certain amount of satisfaction of being there all the time with the kid, being at work, uh, and how to do that and what might be more important in terms of getting a career. It's a very complicated, very complicated journey that of all of the journey conversations I talk about generally has the least satisfactory answer because there is always a huge sacrifice. Unless you're really, really wealthy and you're an independent contractor like a uh, a sports star, movie star, whatever, and you can bring your nanny and your kids with you and do all that. But that's, you know, half 1% of the population, quarter of 1%. I'm definitely not in that percentage of the population yet, but I was very encouraged, Rob, just the idea that later in life that you could accomplish a lot of these things that you'd like to accomplish. And, you know, like Maxwell Maltz is a guy, you know, who created that later in life. And there's plenty of examples of people. And I think it's encouraging, you know, to a lot of people who might be listening to our podcast. And, you know, so I, I think that's very encouraging, you know. It, it is, you know, I'll just park him back and, and I don't know if we're on a hard stop in an hour, but the first brand name motivational speaker I ever heard, and he really wasn't at the top of the, at the top of the charts that game was Terry Bradshaw. And I think it was just trying to get into the game or whatever. This is in the mid 1990s. So I'll just say 1996 ish. And he began his speech. <clears throat> uh, and he said, basically, I wake up every morning, I put two feet on the ground, and I say, thank God I'm alive. And he went on to say that. Uh, as long as he, as, he, as he had mental control, and this is really heart and soul of, of, of the coaching we do, of, of what he could think, and he was alive, then he could impact the rest of his life. Uh, Viktor Frankl wrote a great book, Man's Search for Meaning. He was a concentration camp survivor. And he said, man can take away everything from you, but he cannot take away your attitude in any given specific idea or concept or, or, or arena you're in. And as long as you have the capability to control how you think about something, you can persevere, survive, and achieve. And so, Bill, in any of those scenarios, as long as a person can take control of their attitude, whether it be in how they perceive an idea, whether it be the coach that is sitting around with people that are making 50 times what they're making, trying to get them to coalesce as a group because you do have to work as a team, or the young rock star player who has his career ended on day one, it is all a matter of how do you think through that? Because the mind controls everything and how you think about something will control what you're gonna do the next minute to move forward in your life. Rob, well, thank you so much for being on with us today. I think there's so many uh, uh, great things that we talked about from the beginning, middle, and that uh, unfortunately, uh, 
uh, later in life where I think you're kind of deemed as maybe being a little obsolete and kind of finding a, uh, a, a place there. Um, all the work that you do, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's excellent. And thank you for, for being on. My pleasure. I've had great coaches. I don't think I've done an original idea. There are no original ideas. They're said a little differently. So I've been blessed with a lot of great people within the John Maxwell organization. And I'm just blessed to be on someone that is thought of so well as, as you, Bill. And that's not necessarily true of a lot of folks uh, in your business. Well, thank you. And let's, and let's talk again. We definitely need to uh, to, to stay in touch because uh, I, I, I need your thoughts. I need your positive thoughts. Uh, it's I, I, I need to learn I something that, every day. I think um, I'll either forward to you, maybe we'll hook up on LinkedIn. The excerpts of the 17 laws of teamwork, I think would be very helpful. Uh, there are things that you absolutely know, they're just coalesced in, in, in 17 phrases, but it's a great starting point for, for anything that you're doing or might do or might relate to other people. And it has a lot to do with our conversation.